with Minnesota State, Mankato, the Mavericks. They're in the NSIC Division II squad. And uh, guys, this is a team that, you know, since 2008, they had won eight NSIC regular season championships, 10 NSIC South Division championships. They lost in the 2019 National Championship to West Florida. West Florida went on that run. They beat Ferris in the semifinal and then beat Mankato in the final, in the championship that year, 48-40. to 40. It was a freaking offensive shootout. Um, and otherwise, just had, we've highlighted him a little bit, Elijah McGee, the former linebacker from the Mavericks. He was selected by the Houston Roughnecks in the XFL rookie draft. They've done a pretty good job of placing their guys uh, in some pro spots. But before we get into talking about some more of the specifics of their team and kind of the guys they return this next year, kind of taking a look at their stadium and their setup uh, over there in Minnesota, that is a look at their football stadium. And... You know what? Nice. Real simple as far as setup goes, but, but man, it's it's just a nice setup. It really yeah. is. A lot of stands too for Division Two Stadium, I would say. Yes, like, and they don't neglect the visiting side. No, that's what's unique. I think. I think so. Like it's even, and you yeah. have that. You can see in the back there. There's that good portion of of room where a lot of people seem to be at large scoreboard in this near end zone towards us. But what makes it really unique, fellas? This is something that I don't know if I've ever seen that football stadium before. Is this picture right here? Yeah, it's unreal. They're playing ice hockey out in the football yeah, and they're field. They're a damn good hockey team too. They are absolutely crazy hockey team. We should have beat them. Northern should have beat them in the CCHA championship yep. this last year. Ended up blowing that thing late. But that building in the back of the end zone, pretty sweet. But the ability for them to go out and put an ice hockey rink on this thing, we know Minnesota hockey is king out over there in Minnesota. That is incredible. Yeah. That's- yeah. That's pretty sweet. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Have either of you guys? No. Yeah. Uh, oh, on the football, on their, like, on, on their f- football. College football field? Um, the big house. The big house does it? They have, have done it. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, that's the only other one I know of. I, I, might be, I might be wrong, but I think they have. Looking at now, heading through some of the other facilities, this is the look at the locker room, boys. Looks nice. I mean, yeah. Uh, let me get. Hey, let me. Can we get two of those chairs for the for the studio? Y'all, we can keep the logos on them too. I mean, we just we just take them right from there. If y'all, yeah, for sure. You know what I'm saying? That's nice. It's really. It's nice. cool. I think it's cool to have like the little like where the chairs are, like so you can sit and kind of like relax in the locker room too, if you wanted to. Absolutely. Now, when you think like, about you're not like ahead. crammed right in front of your locker. Yes. What do you think about though, like? You think those get abused like after practice, dude? Sweaty as shit, and just sits down, and those things get disgusting, or what? What do you think about that? I mean, they might probably, have a rule, but probably should. But a hundred guys. I bet in like there. I bet like it's the seniors. Like the seniors get the chairs, probably. Do you think so? Yeah. I wonder if or maybe got like any rules you, like that. Maybe you like <clears throat> earn the chair. Oh, maybe. I have to see him on that. Some stipulations. What about they got like a little? Uh, might have a little TV on this wall tucked away over here, or a PS4 or something, a PS5. Excuse me. Um, or something along that nature. Finally, fellas, look at the weight room as we kind of highlight, oh, excuse me, all their facilities Looks of big. the Mavericks. A lot of space in there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't, this, don't know, this almost looks like a rec center type deal, but when I looked it up on their athletics facilities, this is what came up. And you can see actually behind the racks, there is a strip of turf. Mm-hmm. Can you see that kind of hiding back there? Yeah. So, pretty neat. Definitely uh, some top notch facilities over there in Mankato. And now we can dive into a little bit of what this team is all about. Now, gave you some of those stats earlier on. Let's talk a little bit about returners. Obviously, it starts at the quarterback position for just about every team that we talk about, and this one is no different. Hayden Ecker, he's going into his junior year. He's 6'2", 205 out of St. Rita in Chicago, and this kid is someone who is certainly growing into his role at a very fast rate. When you look at his stats from last year, you're talking 10 games played, 88 attempts, and... Oh, no, sorry. That's rushing. Excuse me. Uh, 115 completions for about 1,800 yards, 17 tuds, four interceptions. Mm-hmm. Taking care of the ball pretty well for a kid who just played started as a sophomore yeah, in their games. That's impressive. Um, really put together a really solid stat line. And something that I really wanted to highlight for him from him, looking at his game-by-game performance when I did go through... Against Colorado School of Mines, a team that we know all went all the way to the national final, in the second round of the NCAA tournament, he recorded 377 passing yards and four touchdowns Holy against shit, that wow. Mines defense. Yeah, that's... Wow. For a sophomore. That's legit. I mean, the, the brightest lights, you make it to the first round of the playoffs, they get to the second round, and they play a team that we know eventually went to the national championship and lost to Ferris, and he put up really good numbers. Now, I will say... Mines was definitely more so known for that offensive attack and the yeah. way they just 
battered teams offensively, but that's a championship quality team. Yeah, I mean, they still have to have a decent defense. They went to the national Oh, absolutely, more than decent. You're right. Yeah, like that, you have to have a good defense. You're not going to the national championship if you don't have a good defense. Yeah. No. Defense wins championships. Absolutely not. Now, um, yeah, not as much of a... Wrong, but. <laughs> Not as much of a rushing threat as some of the other guys we've highlighted on here. Um, hundred and or excuse me, eighty-eight attempts last year for about three hundred yards. Um, eight touchdowns though, so definitely a red zone threat with his legs, which is uh, a big part of their game. But I don't see him being a guy that's going to run all over you. He's a guy who's a little more calculated and haven't gotten a chance to watch a ton of film on him or anything. But uh, another guy on that offense is going to make his job a lot easier. That's Shen Butler Lawson. He's back. He had 176 carries last year for over 1,000 yards, 12 touchdowns. He averaged almost six yards per touch. That's amazing. Just on the ground. That's unreal. That's incredible. Yeah. So the Which, uh, the senior back is going to make his job. I mean, with a young quarterback to have a guy like yeah. that back there. I mean, he's not young anymore. He's going to be a junior, and he's played in some really big playoff games. You got I mean, you talk about at the NFL level what the formula is to win and get a young quarterback on his rookie deal and then pay the hell out of everyone around him, right? Right. College football, like, at the D2 level, is a little bit different, right? But it helps to have an established run game with an established running back. Absolutely. Makes it so much easier for a quarterback. Yeah, it opens everything out. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Now, a guy that we actually posted on our graphic yesterday about the uh, East-West Shrine Bowl 1000, that would be Trey Vavil. And he's had, he had quite the 2022 season. He had 38 tackles at DB over there, five PBUs. Averaged 20 yards per punt return and return kicks for them. Was a return specialist. Did a lot for them in that regard in the special teams. He was first team all NSIC return specialist and a second team all NSIC DB. So but he averaged 20 yards per, per punt return. That's phenomenal. It's a pretty solid number. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty solid number. I mean, think about it. That's that's and flip, obviously that's took flipping, a few back. Well, that's flipping a lot of the field too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, so yeah, he's uh, he's kind of Mister Do It All that's over big. there for him. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a guy they definitely are loving to have back. He was a Cliff Harris Award nominee. That award goes to the top defensive player in small college football, and uh, definitely, you know, we see a good amount of nominees. But even to get in that conversation is very impressive, and that has nothing to do with his return. Status, right? That is yeah. strictly defensive back. So I don't want to make it out to seem that this guy is just catching kicks and punts. He does both. But he's also a really a great threat on the defensive side of things at the DB position. He was a second team All American last year as well for them, who's returning. Really big deal. Just got named the Shrine Bowl 1000. That is something we highlighted. You should definitely check out the whole list. Um, but they go through and they highlight a thousand of the most like pro eligible players for the Shrine Bowl at the end of the year and also like who they just give the best grades to. I believe something along those lines. So there were uh, 10 or 11 Division II guys and about four Division III guys that were given that honor of being in the Shrine 1000. He was one of them. I will say, fellas, they are losing two of their top three tacklers on defense. Peyton Conrad, honorable mention, All-American and first team, All-NSIC linebacker, is leaving, I do believe, along with uh, the guy we talked about earlier, Elijah McGee. We got picked up by the Roughnecks. He's out of there. That was their number one and number three leading tacklers on that defense. Big big shoes to fill for Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely. Defensive side of things, it gets a little bit different for them too because their old defensive coordinator, Jim Glogowski, is now the head coach at Sioux Falls. Mm. He was big time for them there. Coached a number of All-Americans, number of first-team All-Conference selections. They had a 64-14 and 14 record when Jim Glogowski was the D.C. at Mankato. Oh. That is really impressive, and that's hard to do at any level of football. Now, Bringing in some more defensive coaches at Mankato. The new defensive coordinator will be, uh, excuse me, it is Todd Taylor. And he is... Where's he from? Excuse me, right here. Yes, he's the new defensive coordinator. Uh, He served as the Mavericks special teams coordinator and defensive line coach in 2022. Mm. And so they hired from within, promoted him up after losing their old D.C., and then uh, Lavelle Jackson entering his sixth season with the Mavericks. He is the assistant defensive coordinator and defensive backs coach. So he gets a little bit of a promotion inside as well. Um, has coached up, like we talked about, Vavil, but also Peyton Conrad being a DB, one of those leading tacklers. Uh, All-American honors. He was a big part of their development last year. And then finally, Austin Schmidt, who's entering his fourth season with the Mavericks. And, you know, a lot of new pieces, I guess, is the short way of saying, like, this defense, um, while they did keep it internal, you just got a lot of people moving, Mm -hmm. changing uh, positions. I think we've been through a good amount of that 
right? Having just same faces moving around different positions. Is that as big of a difference or a change that uh, should warrant some skepticism and maybe some struggles early on? I mean, I feel like that whatever they've been doing, you know, the, the past whatever many years has been working. So yeah. I feel like it's really smart of them to keep it in-house. Like, or not like in-house, but like to hire in their building. Yeah. Because I just don't think like, I mean, the guy's been around, you know, he's been their special teams coach or whatever coach you were saying. So I really do think that like that was a, their best option. I think their that their greatest chance to succeed would be you know doing that like elevating the next guy. You think that's gonna be the next, what, however you said his name. Yeah. I forgot what is it, how to pronounce his name. The old DC. Glogowski. Glogowski. Yeah, to be the next. You know, that's what they're always. Well, trying. he was coaching. They're always trying to find the, them, right? right. You're always trying to find the next. You know, in this case, Sean McVay. You're always trying to find the next Kyle Shanahan at your own school. You know, you're yeah. always trying to you know bring the guys out to shine the brightest light. So. Totally. I don't think it'll be that much of a difference just because I know, like, how that goes personally playing at a college level and, like, just knowing that, you know, when it's when some guys are D.C., you're not just have a relationship with him, right? You, you If you're a good dude, which we got a lot of good guys, you know, that play football, you're going to have a relationship with a lot of guys. So, I mean, yeah. they probably already know him pretty well. They it's probably, interesting, too, because he takes the head coach job at Sioux Falls. That's in their conference. Yeah. So they'll be playing them um, this year, which is we can take a look at their um, some of the results and schedules last year. But before we do that, I wanted to look at the uh, NSIC standings from last year. And if we look on here in the north, obviously in the south, they were on top. But you look at the north, the outright winner last year, Bemidji State, they had themselves a year, 6-0 and in conference play. Or, excuse me. Uh, yeah, six and zero in division play, and then nine and two in conference. Now this year, this upcoming year in 2023, the fall, this is actually the first year I believe in a long time, or if not ever, where the NSIC teams actually have out of conference games, mm. which is mm. very interesting. Like we have talked about, yeah, we had Northern we State. have two of them on the route and the, Duluth. the schedule. We open with Duluth and close Northern State. Some of the teams have one, some have two, depending on I guess how their schedule shaped out. But you will see here, like you play 11 games, all 11 of them last year were in conference. I didn't realize how large, really. Yeah, there's a shit ton of teams, bro. Is, that's really that's ridiculous. So Bemidji State was on top in the north. Duluth, really right behind them. Then it dropped off a little bit. You had a couple teams like uh, Northern State and Moorhead kind of battling out in the middle of the pack, but really two powerhouses there. And then you come down here, and it's almost the same case. Minnesota State was on top of this conference in pretty good control, but Winona State right behind them. They've had some really good years in recent history. Wayne State right there, Sioux Falls kind of battling it. And then you look at even a team like Augustana. Like, that is a really good squad. So there's some pretty good depth to this NSIC conference. I'm glad, personally, that uh, a lot of the GLIAC teams are going to be open to having competition with some of these schools out in Minnesota and South Dakota and all these other uh, places where these schools come from. But I need to... There's my mouse. Okay. Had to get it back here. But we can look, fellas, before we move on. Right here at the 2022 results, before we look at their schedule for this upcoming year... They finished at 10-3 and three last year, 9-2 and two in conference. And this first game for them last year, you'll notice, a win over Bemidji State. And we said they were 6-2 and two in their division play, that being in the north. So it did not count against them, right? Because uh, Mankadia was in the south of the NSIC. And look at those first two weeks for them. They beat Bemidji State, and then they beat Duluth back-to-back. They had to be riding pretty high after I that. I combined 10 points. And Absolutely. they lose to the Northern State by a lose point. Northern State by one. Holy shit. The the margin of victory here in this conference. What a conference, win for Northern State, dude. Holy really shit. low. Exactly. That's a huge win. Them being in the same division, obvi- or sorry, the separate division still. Um, then you go, they get back on track a little bit. Squeak, University of Mary. Squeak by University of Mary. Dude, like, absolutely. Yeah. And then Concordia St. Paul, and put another one in the wrong column there. At Wayne State, a tough one. But again, these margins, guys. Not really that large. And you look at a team like Augustana that was nationally ranked last year. They finished 3-3 three and three in division play. That's really incredible. Like, this conference has a lot going on with it. You see some of the rankings here. Bemidji, obviously, being a ranked opponent. Duluth probably should have been. They ended yeah. up being a ranked opponent and made the playoffs. And then you look at Winona State, Sioux Falls, Augustana. All of these teams with the numbers in front of them. And they are winning against all of them. So this squad has a lot to look forward to. For sure. And they got a quarterback uh, in 2023. Thing. Absolutely. They got a lot to look forward to. And speaking of 2023, why don't we take a look at their 2023 schedule? They do have an out-of-conference game this year that was just finalized. We'll take a look at that. Um, it doesn't get much easier for them. Sioux Falls, Wayne State, their first two openers. 
definitely that week two for them is going to be a revenge game. They get Wayne State to come at their place. Maybe Wayne State will be wearing those new black uniforms. Maybe. Maybe. Then Hopefully they number, not number 90 has eight sacks. Yeah. Hopefully he wears black gloves, though. Hopefully not, not white, white gloves. gloves. Please. He yellow. Followed, he followed us, by the way, on Insta. Yeah, yellow, black. That. It's not white, bro. <laughs> Just but moving on through their conference, you can see here they're out of conference versus Western Oregon. Western Oregon struggled quite a bit in the Lone Star this last year, so not exactly adding a whole lot of strength to their schedule. But do you really need it no, with this conference? It's kind of like, I hate to be like biased, but it's kind of like the GLIAC in a, in a sense. Absolutely. That every week you're playing against a legit opponent, basically. Yeah. You're going to have four or five teams that you play that will probably be ranked at some point in the year. Yeah. Like every year, like without a doubt. And this is almost the same way. Like that's we saw what, yeah, the rankings last saying. year. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. So interesting stuff for them. Definitely going to be a big year for the Mavericks. We're excited to, to follow along with them. If there's anything else we should know about the Mavericks, be sure to let us know.